Hello and welcome for another episode of the season of Try This on Wisp Sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kirsten Lauritsen, and today I have a guest with me. Her name is Drew Mulvey. She graduated from the University of Bridgeport with a Master's of Science in Human Nutrition and then also received a Bachelor of Arts in Biology in 2012. Um, she is a dietitian, nutri- a certified dietitian nutritionist, as well as a board certified nutrition specialist, a leap therapist, a precision nutrition level one coach, a NASM certified personal trainer. And she also has her own practice, Redeeming Life Nutrition LLC. She's gained a ton of nutrition experience through working with weight loss clinics, personal training, interning under a naturopathic doctor, and also through her personal practice as well as, um, and under a functional medicine nutritionist. She is really, her story is really awesome. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. She has, and I won't steal it from her, but uh, we have a lot to talk about as far as nutrition goes, but also her personal um, journey through nutrition and how she learned how to heal herself. Um, She just authored her first cookbook titled The No Title Cookbook, catered to those who foods with food sensitivities or those looking to transition to a healthier way of eating without sacrificing the taste. Drew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kirsten. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. Okay, so first question, what is your history in sports? Okay, so I have been an athlete my whole entire life. So when I was younger, you name it, I played it. Soccer, field hockey, softball, basketball. Um, oh my gosh, what are the other ones? I didn't play lacrosse, but it was I was always doing some sort of rec sport, but Um, my passion really stemmed. I was a gymnast for six years of my life and I always loved to swim. Always. I was a fish. And so I found that the two met with diving and I was actually a very um, serious diver for about 13 years of my life. As soon as I got on that board, it was just instant. Um, I dove in college. I was a D1 diver. I was all, all American in high school. And then after that, after diving, I got into triathlons because that was actually one of my goals as a freshman in college. Even when I was diving, I was like, you know what? I, um, I want to get into triathlons. And I totally admit this. The guy that I really liked was in the triathlon, <laughs> but I had no idea that I was going to fall in love with it. I bought my first bike and I was cycling all that summer and I was starting to transition. So I did track and field and I was more of a sprinter, but then I started transitioning into more of the longer distances and I started loving it. And then I've always loved swimming. So it kind of put everything together. And then from there, I incorporated some CrossFit. Like I've always been in the gym. Um, that's one of the things that I started incorporating actually as a division one diver, because you have the strength training and then you have your water workouts and I improved so much. And that's when I really started to see the value of fitness and strength training and being in the gym. And so applying that to not only what my goals are, but to my performance as well, it's just been such a nice blend. So now I've been able, I've already done Two triathlons. They've just nice. been sprint triathlons, but they have been so much fun. And you you honestly catch the triathlon bug. Yeah, you do, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So that's me. I've pretty much been athletic my whole entire life. Nice. Was there, um, well, let's dive into triathlon real quickly. Um, do you have a favorite discipline? Of the three? Ooh cycling i Uh, love being on my bike yeah i've actually done um 110 mile bike ride i did that a couple of years ago for we have a closer to free ride here which is raising money for cancer and that was always one of my my uh, goals was to do a century ride and we did 112 miles nice okay is there a discipline that you dislike or maybe i should say is the hardest (laughs) oh I think all of them are honestly pretty equal I I would say because it's very hard to get to training for like swimming um that one I wouldn't say it's my least favorite but it has been my weakest out of the three 
Interesting. And that's just simply because of the barrier for training? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I would expect since you grew up in the pool and uh, doing a lot that the, the swimming piece of it wouldn't be too wouldn't be too much of an issue. I could be super hard on myself too. <laughs> okay, so that's fair. I'm thinking like, hey, I could definitely be doing better, but oh no, okay. I mean like when I get in the water, I can definitely feel that I have that muscle memory. Um, I get back on it. I was yeah. more of a sprinter, so I think I'm also starting oh, yeah, yeah. to transition to like the longer distances with swimming. And that just happened like a couple of years ago. So I think my body's just catching up with that in that particular discipline. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so kind of diving into some of the meat of what we're going to talk about today. The What has your experience been as a female athlete? Um, so go a little deeper on that. Okay, so well, starting to kind of get into what brought you into nutrition, what brought you into working on your health, like what has been your background as far as like on your your chronic issues side of things um, that sort of brought you through this journey to getting into nutrition and working with athletes? Oh, okay, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, Mm -hmm. when I was in college. It was my freshman year and I was getting sick every single month. And at that point we saw alternative care and I found out that I had chronic fatigue, immune dysfunction. I had fibromyalgia. I had a candida buildup. Prior to that, um, I never really had any energy. Um, I was on meds for ADHD and IBS. And so... What else did I have? Oh, I had an autoimmune condition where my natural killer cells were attacking themselves. And from that, I just was, I wasn't able to have the diving career that I wanted to. I also had gotten a concussion that year and had, um, I was bulimic that year as well. So it was just a cascade of things. And that's when I learned about that. That was the first therapeutic diet I went on is an anti-candida diet. And to give that to a 20 year old who usually had, I'm going to totally admit this, the Domino's guy knew my name and I would have cookie yeah. dough sometimes for dinner. So I was not always like the best with nutrition and completely changing my diet and feeling how much it improved me, my health showed me, okay, well, I'm really into this alternative care. And from there, I still had issues in my 20s. But when I had gone into my master's program, I had this vision, like I want to help female athletes to stay as healthy as they can to have great athletic performance and to prevent these things. And so that kind of sparked my whole journey into going and getting a master's into nutrition, getting deeper into functional medicine, getting deeper into functional nutrition. So that's basically certain components of foods that go beyond just their health benefits that they help help with specific things, which I'm going to talk a little bit about with that. And now um, I just don't want any female athlete to have to go through what I did. I did because it was all preventable but I didn't know about all these tests and all of this care back then. Sure. Sure. Yeah. If if you wanted to keep going on that. Um, So uh, recently I started incorporating like the organic acids tests. And from there I had, let's see, what have I done the past couple of years? I've looked into acupuncture. I've looked into naturopathic medicine. I've gotten out on a good supplement routine. Um, My nutrition is, well, the cookbook came because I I went on multiple different therapeutic diets. So paleo was probably one of the other one, the first ones that I went on. Then it was mostly vegan. Um, I think I accidentally did like keto once at that point. I think I was just trying to play around with things. And from there, I realized everybody has such a unique, uh, how do I want to say this? They're all have their own bio individuality and you need to treat the person as that. So from there, it's like, instead of looking at it as a therapeutic diet, I'm so, uh, 
passionate about creating dishes and I get so creative in the kitchen that I try to make the most nutrient dense dishes as possible and the most the most emotionally satisfying dishes to help with my performance. And from there, I've gotten my athletic ability back. I mean, I was in bed for half of my 20s and I was sleeping most of the day. And to be able to have that back now, I wish that I had that when I was a freshman in college and I had all these tests that all these things could have been, I could have seen them in front of me instead of, oh, well, that's just how it is. Yeah, that's a, that's a really hard part. I think with, especially when you've had a chronic condition for longer than a, you know, like maybe six months or a year, once it becomes really chronic and you have it for a long time, it kind of becomes one of those things that you can get complacent with in a sense, Mm -hmm. as far as like treating it, because it just becomes part of normal life. Like you just, yeah, like I, I can totally understand that. I think part personally with my, my journeys, I just don't like to feel bad. So Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) I just don't have any, I don't have any patience for it. So even though I've had like, especially with like migraines and endometriosis and things like that. Like, I just, I just hate the fact that they're not, that it's not like pain. Like I don't have a pain free existence, I guess. (laughs) So I just pursue, I, I just am relentless with pursuing, trying to get them to be the least problematic as possible as possible. Um, but I think it's also the flip side of that is it's also really easy to just be like, well, this is just the way it is. There's nothing I can do about it. Oh, well. (laughs) Right. And that's, yeah, there's two sides of it for sure. Right. Definitely. Um, as far as from the, like your experience with your, um, eating disorder, you also lost your period for a, uh, a, a long period of time there too, right? Yeah, I did. And I think those were intimately connected. Um, yeah. it's interesting that I didn't really realize what I was doing to my body because I was being super healthy, right? Mm-hmm. I was doing paleo or I was doing this or I was doing that, but then, um, then I was getting into weight loss. And so I did this program that, you know, we were checking in every week. And then I did like this ultimate fat loss program and it worked at first. But then the problem is I was doing something really stupid where I was trying to count my calories so low. I I guess this would be termed um, exercise anorexia. I was only having about a thousand calories a day and I was working out five, six days a week and intense. And so that was the start of it. And then I just did not have a good relationship with food. And it wasn't until my master's program when we talked about what orthorexia is and it's that insane obsession with being healthy. I would be fearful to have non-organic ketchup or something like that. I was terrified. And because of that, the stress on my body from not eating enough, the stress from being too active, I wasn't listening to my body. I was exhausted, but I was still going and I was working out. You can even see me from today and from back then like my hair was all kinky I couldn't retain muscle mass or muscle tone um I mean I was squatting about 150 and you definitely couldn't even see that in my physique and so finally it was just something you know personal in my life that it was just the straw that broke the camel's back and then it just went Mm. did you did you have um, like coaches helping you through some of that? Or do you feel like part of it was just, was it mostly self-driven? Um, through the process of healing, I, my master's program definitely helped me because I was going to okay. several doctors. You know, I mean, like I lost it for like, you know, six months. I'm like, ah, you know, this happens sometimes with coming off birth control, which I had come off a year prior, but I was, you know, I had normal periods. And then once it got into like seven months, eight months, I'm like, you know, maybe I should seek help for this. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to an endocrinologist. They didn't really know what was going on. You know, they're like, well, you need to eat a little bit more. You need to do this. You need to do that. So I did start eating a little bit more. 
And then I went to a reproductive specialist and he told me at this point, it's been ingrained in my head and ingrained in my body. And I'm never getting my period back because that's the thing is it was a lot of the mental stress that did it too. And it's very common, obviously with the amenorrhea, there is that the hypothalamus and then there's the adrenals or the pituitary. And then there's the ovaries too. And your body can respond to that. And because I had that disordered eating pattern already, that was putting so much stress on my body. So what I did through my master's, I became fascinated with traditional Chinese medicine, absolutely fascinated and how different emotions are linked to different organs and how it's called food energetics and how specific foods have different temperatures and energies and they help with specific things in the body. So that would be mine, for instance, was my chi. So that's your vitality. And so to incorporate, they recommend to incorporate like more warming foods. So a lot of the orange vegetables, oats, chickpeas, um, brown rices, because it's helping with blood flow, digestion, any sort of mental angst, which I was going through all of that too. So I incorporated that. I was seeing a dietitian for a time and I did have to increase the calories, um, And I was scared of carbs. That was one of my problems with the impaired relationship with food is I was terrified to incorporate any sort of carbs because I was terrified of gaining weight with them. But at that point, when I heard from the reproductive specialist, you can't even have a kid naturally. And let alone, I had borderline osteopenia. So basically estrogen, my estrogen had tanked and estrogen is not only responsible for your reproduction, but you know this, it's responsible for keeping, maintaining your bones. And it's also responsible for your heart health too. So my LDL, my triglycerides are going up. Like this was kind of scary at this point. I knew I needed to do something, but that's when I learned that my body actually really likes carbohydrates and my ovaries actually really liked the carbohydrates. So little by little, um, I started feeling better. I did have to take a little bit of time off. I don't want to say time off, but, um, well, I was fueling properly around my workouts. Like I was fueling before and I was fueling after to let my body know you're not in a state of starvation. You're not in a state of stress. So little by little, by taking those things into account, um, I started to see, you know, spotting here and there. And with traditional Chinese medicine, also, I looked into, I don't know if you've heard anything about this, but seed cycling. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I hadn't really been consistent with that. And then I decided, okay, you know, I really want this to come back. I got consistent with it. And basically what seed cycling is, is you're incorporating particular seeds during particular cycles. So during the follicular phase, you're incorporating pumpkin seeds and you're incorporating flax seeds. So basically what it's supposed to do is the lignans are supposed to decrease or clear out any sort of excess estrogen because your estrogen is starting to rise, but it keeps it nice and balanced. And then the pumpkin seeds, they're helping your body, like priming your body for the luteal phase, which is the second phase of your, your cycle, because that's when the progesterone starts to increase. Then after uh, um, 14 days, or as you were saying, actually, one of your podcasts, um, everybody's ovulation or everybody's um, cycle can be different. So, you know, we'll just go with normal, like 28 days. So after the 14th day, so incorporating the sunflower seeds and sesame seeds in there. And interestingly enough, the sesame seeds have lignans as well. So to clear out that extra estrogen and just to balance everything out. So I did that maybe for six months, incorporating all of these other things, um, having fun with carbohydrates. Uh, I actually had to decrease some animal protein, but now that's not so much the case anymore. I actually, I did need the protein. Um, And, oh yeah, as I told you, um, I think that my mental game around my workouts changed a lot. And that's when I was like, I'm, I have a goal. I want to do this triathlon. And I was enjoying 
the workouts that I was doing. I was mentally preparing. Um, I think what helped me so much is I read this book called How Bad Do You Want It? And it's about endurance athletes. And it just showed me how that mental preparation can keep your body in a state of um, rest and digest instead of fight or flight. And you can enjoy those things and going out and running and being on my bike. And even if I was working out a lot, I've been regular ever since. And that's been a year and a half now. There, oh yeah. So there's a lot of things in there. First, it's, it's first off. Um, I think it's really cool in some ways that, that sport kind of got you into this, but it also helped you get out of it at the same time. Um, Mm -hmm. which is a, which it became the problem and the solution, which is cool. But the, I'm, I'm a little bit caught up on the fact that the, the, um, the specialist told you that you would never get your period back. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't believe that they would say that. Yeah, I know. And then after that, I was on a mission. I'm like, okay, you can't tell me that this is going to happen. Do you think that it was like to scare you? Or do you think he was really being, or the person was really being honest? He was being honest. Like he was saying, okay, so I, I, I knew immediately that you had hypothalamic amenorrhea when you walked in here because you're very fit. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. That's good. And so at that point, I had lost my period for two years. And he's like, you know, at at this point, if you haven't had anything, it's just you can eat as much as you need to. You could cut back on your workouts, but you're just not going to get it. It's already hardwired into your body. Like you could go out and eat McDonald's. Like I wasn't even eating McDonald's at that point, but he was just trying to make a point. You could go out and you could have McDonald's and ice cream and all that stuff. And it just wouldn't work. Oh, that's, that's, um, hmm, that's something else. I, okay. So I, I guess I'll move on from that. I just feel like that's really an interesting way to, to, I I don't want to get down a rabbit hole. (laughs) But yeah, I just, I just find that quite shocking just because like, I, I do understand that there are some cases where, yeah, like you may, you, you could do so much damage where it's not reversible, but I, I think, and maybe you might be able to speak to this as well, but from like what I've seen with functional medicine is it's, there's a piece of it that you don't want to give false hope for sure. But there's also not from like what I've seen anyway, there's always some room for improvement. Um, and it's never, there's always room to try to like figure out what, what, how we can, how we can try to, you know, we have a lot of tools essentially. And if, if I can't do something, there's likely going to be somebody else that may have a different set of tools and a different set of kind of alternative ways of treating things that aren't always in everybody's toolbox. Um, and, and also I would probably say too, it, it is a journey to get your period back in many ways. I've worked with several athletes and trying to get their periods back and it just, it takes time. And mm-hmm. I think also a lot of people aren't always willing to, well, not willing. It is a journey to get there because it's a mental thing. It's a, um, it's, you've got to change your patterns and sometimes just changing those habits and routines is a journey in and of itself. Yeah. So I can understand he may have just been like, well, most people in this case just don't just don't get their period back because it's it's there's too much to do um Mm -hmm. but there's but to to do that and to to basically like put that on you is like there's no there's no chance that to me is is really brutal (laughs) yeah no but it's kind of funny because when somebody says that to me i'm like watch me yeah right right especially speaking to an athlete that's a challenge (laughs) yes I'm like okay you say this and I bet you I'm going to be able to do it and they wanted to try to put me on birth control pills and birth control pills previously had contributed to my fibromyalgia and why I got so sick so I didn't want to go back on them because they have they have a tendency to potentially deplete you of vitamin B6. So it Uh did more damage to me than it did good. 
And luckily, I went to a hematologist and they found that I have a genetic predisposition to clotting and I could have gotten a clot or a stroke if I went back on birth control. So I fought Mm. that. And Uh the problem is, is like, you know, they wanted to help to increase my estrogen level. And I was working with my gynecologist and he was wonderful. You know, he was the one that was supporting me all the way. I'm like, I don't want to do this. I feel like it's a Band-Aid and it's a Band-Aid and I can do this naturally. And so from there, um, I had to incorporate fish oil just for that. But Mm -hmm. I was looking for other ways that I could use food and I could use fuel. I mean, the carbohydrates, another big thing about carbohydrates is they decrease cortisol levels. At that point, you know, I didn't have very much fat on my body. Um, I was pushing myself way too hard. And mentally, I didn't have a good relationship with food. And I had... I had to get over that hump. Like carbohydrates are okay. Oh, it's okay to have a little ice cream here and there. Oh, it's okay to go off track a little bit. But from that journey, I've been able to find what works best for me. And maybe it's the 80, 20 rule for others. Maybe it's the 90, 10, but because of that, it's repaired my relationship with food so much. And now like, I don't really I don't even think so much about like um, what I'm looking like. I'd rather eat more and perform better than ever have to feel the way that I did. Yeah. I think that's, that's the really big key right there, which is especially for athletes. And this is kind of where I, I kind of, especially when I have somebody come in that, that maybe is struggling with food and their relationship with food and they're an athlete, the, the key is to focus on the performance side of it, you know, yeah. because as soon as, as soon as you, and you'll watch it, I mean, just at certain different types of body compositions, athletes will function and perform way better. And it's not the same per athlete. It's very unique and different for that specific person. Mm-hmm. And part of it is just, is just digging into that a little bit more and figuring out what specifically your body needs in order to perform well. And it gives you a lot of freedom in there too, when you get to that, because it's less of Oh, I have to do it this specific way. I have to be this way. Most of the time, the body functions a lot better with a little bit of um, like that body fat percentage. There is a there is a percentage in there that that where most athletes will perform, female athletes will perform really, really well. And it's not as low as you'd think. Um, Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, we, if for, for those of you listening, like where we start to get into danger ranges around like 11% body fat, 11, 12% or lower is where mm-hmm. many athletes will start to lose their period. And so that's, that's the, the, so usually where they perform really well and they, they call it like, I guess the athletic range is anywhere between like 15 to 18 or 19 is usually like a very, a very nice body fat percentage range to be. For those of you that, that are kind of looking at that side of things, but that that's again, where it comes back to testing this and working on it and seeing where you, where your performance markers are the best is where that, like, that's what you want to do for yourself. But there were a couple of things that you mentioned that I wanted to jump back to really quickly. First off with the carbohydrates helping to lower cortisol. This is part of why we talk so much here about, especially for our female athletes, why we really don't want to be training fasted because part of what happens in the morning or like, so most people, like a lot of people have heard that intermittent fasting is really good. And actually you and I talked about this just a little Mm -hmm. bit ago. Yeah. Um, But it's really, really difficult for female athletes to, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but it's really, um, it's really, common for athletes to hear that intermittent fasting is really good. So then what they'll do is they'll go out and they'll train in the morning. And that's not as bad of a situation for male athletes, but for female athletes, the issue with that is that it it can increase cortisol and stress on the body. And so part of why you'll always hear for, especially for female athletes to fuel before their workouts even in the morning, you know, even if that's like getting up 10 minutes before you got to head out the door and just putting something, you know, Mm -hmm. in your mouth, which could be like a little bite of a muffin or any, you know, graham crackers even, or anything, Definitely, any sort of carbohydrate will help to drop and lower that cortisol on the system so that you're not creating more damage essentially, and more stress on your body when you're going out to go train. 
So that's that's a big one. The the other interesting piece, which ties in your story, though, um, is that there are a lot of programs, especially even functional medicine programs that will incorporate fasting as a part of their Mm -hmm. treatment method. And part of that, part of that is because it can get the body a break from food and digesting food. And that's one thing that can be really healing for the GI tract. Like you'll see fasting as a part of like a lot of, um, I'm going to use air quotes, detoxes and a lot of, um, like autoimmune healing condition, things like that, which is fine, but that doesn't always apply very well to athletes and Uh it can be really problematic for female athletes. Um, so this is kind of where melding that functional medicine and sports performance becomes really critical and, and dealing with that gap there because not all things in both sides are going to apply to an athlete. And that's right. where we have to be really, really, really careful. Right. Yeah. Actually, I had just told Dr. Kirsten that I underwent something from a functional medicine practitioner and it involved fasting. And I literally crashed last week. Um, so so now it's like you're I'm learning more about my body through this. You learn a lot about your body and, you know, just the mindset, because I've gotten that mindset for the past four years now, I'd rather fuel my body for my performance so that I can keep being an athlete my whole entire life. I never want to go down that road ever again where I was I was sick or I was in bed or I didn't have enough energy to be able to do what I wanted to do because I was so focused on the way that I looked. And now just, I have to say, I've been incorporating, I used to incorporate a protein shake in the morning with like a little bit of cacao in it because the caffeine just helps me and gets me through the, um, the workout. And then also you have the essential amino acids in there and the protein, it kind of helps the caffeine not to have as much of an effect. So uh, like in the form of like jitters, like if you get really jittery, because I do have, um, I have Jobert syndrome. So sometimes I feel the effects of things. Basically what that is, is I have trouble clearing things out of phase two liver detoxification. So I just have to be a little bit more careful about that. And sometimes I get jittery with coffee if I don't pay attention to that. Um, But yeah, and now I decided I'm going to have a protein shake with a little bit of carbohydrate. And I have felt a lot better in my workouts Mm -hmm. this week. Yeah. Well, see, that's all it takes sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes it's not that it's sometimes it's so simple, right? Like the, the solutions to what you're experiencing aren't always that, that complicated. Like you don't have to necessarily go and just spend all of your time in the kitchen. Sometimes it's, it's super, super simple, small tweaks that make the biggest impact. Like just putting a little carbohydrate in before you go out and train. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah, no, it has made such a difference. And it's so funny because we kind of talked about this, like we're really into functional medicine and this is what they say and that this is good and that's good. But the problem is, is like a lot of those things, one thing I don't, I don't agree with is they recommend ketogenic diets for endurance athletes. I even just read that on the Institute of Functional Medicine. I'm like, I can't, I can't agree with this anymore. Like I understand the science behind it where they're saying that your body starts to adapt to using fat as fuel. And I mean, if we're going to go into the biochemistry of that, so basically ATP is your energy molecule and you're getting 92 ATP out of a fat molecule as opposed to a carbohydrate, which is about three times more but it's very hard for your body to use a lot, utilize that. And that can create crashes for people, which if your body is not primed or your body doesn't do well with fat anyway, I mean, that's, that's another story that I'm looking into more of like metabolism of things, mm-hmm. then you're going to wreck your performance. And that's the last thing that you would want to do. And I just love what you're kind of saying is that you have to take into account the bio individuality of every single person. And that's what functional medicine is about. So some people are going to do better with fasting. Men are going to do better with fasting. Women, not so much. Yeah. And it, it is definitely individualized. Like there are going to be some people, some, some women who love to fast and that's totally fine. And I know of a, a few friends of mine who did intermittent fasting and they changed a lot of their health markers and that was a really successful thing for them. Mm-hmm. But I think the, yeah, just going back to the point, which is like, um, 
there's I think that, that that there's a lot of space and a lot of room for functional medicine in the sports and athlete world um, and that there's a lot of benefit that can come from that. But uh, yeah, just as as you said, it, it just has to be done in a way that's very specific for athletes and we need to come at it with a perspective of what does an athlete specifically need? And then we need to be careful about how we apply the principles of functional medicine based on these factors of sports performance. And um, yeah, the other thing I was going to mention with that too, is that specifically like with the keto diet, um, because it is so low carb, part of what you also want to be careful of, and this is again, specific for female athletes, which is that, um, if you have low carbohydrate and if you're trying to like avoid them, then what you might do is you may not put carbohydrate in before your workout or after. But the the issue with that is that that carbohydrate that you get um, beforehand helps to fuel your training, which then helps mm-hmm. with, you know, just energy availability, as you mentioned with ATP. And then that is what ends up helping you in that, you know, in that like, um, 45 minute to hour range or that hour to hour and a half when that Mm -hmm. energy tends to tank and drain, like Mm -hmm. you just feel like you just don't have anything left to go. That is a, that feeling there is usually a result of a fueling issue. Like if you just are constantly feeling fatigued towards the end of your workouts, like you can't push that extra, extra distance or, um, or time or whatever that is. And, or if you're getting like any like aches or pains towards the end, those are, signs and symptoms that there's just not enough fuel in the body but then afterwards it's the carbohydrate and the protein that you need that carbohydrate in order to help that protein be able to to um, facilitate muscle recovery and rebuilding but that carbohydrate also helps with um, increasing that fat burning state afterwards because it's different between men and women Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, so again, being like afraid of carbohydrates just really doesn't serve very well, like in this case and, and keto will kind of reinforce that sort of thought that like, oh, I've got to be very careful with carbohydrates. Right. And, and unfortunately that actually can do more harm than good for a good amount of, of athletes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, no, so, I'm so, actually yeah. glad that you mentioned that because I was just having like seeds and things through my long workouts. And then all of a sudden I changed and I started incorporating like dates or simple sugars, but from like com- complex sources. And that was a game changer for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I definitely fall along the lines of like, I know there's many different ways to look at this. And I used to be definitely on the side of like, oh, we've got to be so careful of sugars and we need to do complex sugars and all these things. But as you start learning more and more about just how the body uses fuel, like those simple sugars are not the end of the world. They're not going to be like, they, they are very, very helpful and effective for Mm -hmm. getting you as much energy as possible. Yep. And I just think that where the, where the balance comes from is how you eat outside of your training. Um, and that we, we really just need to not be quite so afraid of, like, I understand sugar causes inflammation. I get it, but there's, um, there's still quite a bit of, again, balance between the two, right? Like there's your daily nutrition that's supporting your workouts. And this is where having your, your nutrition and your fueling and all of those things dialed in is really, really key for, um, not only being a healthy athlete, but also, um, really, really fit. There's, there's two, there's two sides of that. And I do think that those worlds can exist together. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, your body basically after 90 minutes of est- or exercise, your glycogen levels start to tank. And so yeah. your body, if you have simple sugars, that's exactly what your body is yearning for. Yeah. And it, it, as, um, I talked to a naturopath about this, he's like, it vaporizes. So it adds immediate energy to you. And once I yeah. got that concept yeah. and incorporated like dates or even sugars, um, I think this time around with training, I'm going to experiment with carbolin, which is more simple mm-hmm. sugars. It's not simple, simple sugars, but it's simple carbohydrates to kind of like yeah. fuel my longer runs and um, fuel my longer bike rides. So nice. it's it's crazy because... I felt so much better after my workouts when I was including those in, especially when I was on my bike ride. I, um, the 110 mile one, I probably was eating two dates like every half an hour. 
or I, I, pre- I pretty much set a record for the amount of cliff bars one person can have. <laughs> yeah, there you go. When sitting, I think I had eight or nine. <laughs> Dang, that's yeah. a lot. I know. I, I set a personal record, but it helped me so much. And ever yeah. since I grasped that concept, it has helped with my recovery. It's helped mm-hmm. with maintaining my menses and even keeping your cortisol down too. Totally. Totally. Well, we're going to be right back after this short break. So the question I have now is what does your nutrition look like at this point? So we're kind of going that route anyway. So what, what, what does your kind of your day to day sort of look like? What does your nutrition and, and uh, fueling around your training look like now? Okay. So I usually start out with like a protein shake in the morning because I do work out between 5.30, 6.30 in the morning. It used to not be that way. And I just can't go with nothing as I learned a couple weeks ago. I just really can't do that. So now I have a protein shake with like a banana in it. Um, I've been putting some matcha powder in there as well. And then afterwards... Um, I will, I like to get creative in the kitchen. I had some coconut flour pancakes, banana pancakes for breakfast today. So I'm always fueling within like an hour of my workout with carbohydrates and protein, and then a little bit of fat in there too, but just to replenish my body. Um, I'm incorporating antioxidants, which is huge. I'm actually on this product called juice plus, And basically, it's just the fruits and vegetables that have been dehydrated and then put into a capsule. And all you're getting are the antioxidants from there. Um, I do have fish oil, but I take that more in the afternoon. Um, Essential amino acids, I've been starting to incorporate those in a little bit more, like between my meals. Then lunches, I really try to eat as colorful as possible. And I do have protein. So I... There was so much controversial um, information about how much protein you need, and it was for per kilogram or per gram, or there's too much or too little. And so that's been my journey is that I do better with more protein in my diet. So each of my meals always has a good quality protein. So about four to six ounces of a good quality protein, and that could be fish, that could be um, grass-fed beef. Actually, I do better with grass-fed beef like two or three times a week because my iron tends to drop anyway. Um, or I right now I'm not having eggs, but it's usually like pastured eggs in the morning. I think one of my favorite recovery meals was two hard-boiled eggs. I'd have some rolled oats, and then I'd have either some berries in there, or um, I put some golden milk spices, so that's turmeric, cinnamon, ginger, and then like a little bit of pumpkin. So I really try to make my meals as colorful as possible, and I make sure each of them are complex, too. Um, Personally, I'm just eating three times a day, but to me, when you're eating three times a day and the amount that you actually do have to eat to fuel your body, it's going to feel like it's a huge meal, but it does satisfy me, and I feel that it has helped me immensely with now I've increased the calories. I'm at like 2,000, like 2,100 calories and it's been so much better. Um, so I yeah. always have a complex carbohydrate. I always have uh, fat on there, loads of veggies and a protein. So honestly, the more colorful, the better. Yes. The rain eating the rainbow is, is the, is a very easy guide. <laughs> Yes. Every day. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, that sounds pretty awesome. Um, do you have any sort of thing that works really well for you as far as like fueling goes around your workouts? I mean, you mentioned the, you mentioned the, um, the shake beforehand, but do you do anything specifically during your workouts that you're really liking right now? You know what I used to do, and I probably should incorporate this a little bit more right now is, um, I did coconut water with a little bit of lime. So for the potassium, okay. And a little bit of salt too. So for the electrolytes, because sometimes when you're the, when you're training, like your fluid electrolyte balance can get off. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. I, I was incorporating that and I actually really liked it, but now I think I just need to play around with like what I'm having during my workout <laughs> instead of just before and after. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially if they're longer ones, if they're, if they're shorter than like, if they're an hour or less then yeah, you don't necessarily need, need to do that much, but for anything over that, for sure. 
Do you have any um, goals coming up as far as, as a uh, triathlon goes? Do you have any races that you have planned so far? Yeah, I have a couple of them coming up in June, I believe. And this is a possible goal, but I've always wanted to do a half marathon and I'm hoping there's one in like October. Oh, I guarantee you can find one. <laughs> that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds like something that's definitely available. Actually, I think um, I did my first ever half marathon in Leavenworth, Washington, and it was in it was in um, October around Oktoberfest. Oh, mm-hmm. oh nice. Halloween. Yep. <laughs> guarantee you can find one. Definitely. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> okay, so where can our listeners find you? All right, so um, if you visit my website, it's redeeminglifenutrition.com. You can see a little bit more about what I do, who I am, a little bit more about my background. And then Instagram, I am, I believe it's whole.fit.ladies.nutritionist on Instagram for my handle. Um, I'm based out of Connecticut. So if you are in Connecticut, I do have a hybrid practice. I see people online and I see people in person too. So definitely hit me up around the area. And um, I have a YouTube channel now. So I've been putting all my talks. I usually do a Facebook live every Friday on my Facebook or on Instagram. And then I've been putting them up on YouTube and it's under Redeeming Life Nutrition. Nice. Well, that's fun. Um, thank you so much for being here, Drew. I, I feel like I could have talked to you for another hour on a lot of the things that we talked about today. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was so There's always so much to dive into, but I really appreciated you being here and sharing your story because it's one that I know is a really... Um, Unfortunately, it's a very common one in the athletic world, um, especially for female athletes. And I... I appreciate you being open and willing to share your story. Of course. All right. Well, that's our episode for now. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure to follow with sports on all social media channels and also share this episode with anyone you think could benefit from it or might like it. You can also follow me uh, at Dr. Kirsten on Facebook and Instagram, and you can also find me at drkirsten.com. If you'd like to reach us with any comments or questions about this episode, you can either on social media or email us at info at wispsports.com. And you can always leave a direct, oh, that's what I just said. Leave a direct message with us over on social media. Thank you for listening. And I will be back next week. Take care.